Hi, tonight we're going to talk about uh, teaching in an online environment. And what I'm really hoping that you're going to get from this uh, quick session is really about how can we tweak what we're doing online to uh, make our lives as teachers uh, easier and to make our students do the more work because um, you shouldn't be the hardest person working person in your classroom. So, um, so some of the things that we're hearing about uh, the challenges with online teaching is this idea that the students aren't engaging. They're not turning on their camera. You don't know, you're just talking to a sea of black faces or um, initials. Uh, gathering formative feedback is really, really difficult because all of a sudden you, you are finding yourself in a place where um, students aren't interested in showing their faces. They're not interested in engaging. Um, so if you can't see their faces, you can't get those nods. Yes, we understand. No problem, teacher. We, we know what you're doing. So um, so part of uh, what we're going to try to do is give you some more solutions for that. How do we build community? We know that students are more likely to um, uh, engage with their teachers if they feel like they there's trust and there's relationships there. So how do we do that in an online environment? How do we know that they're engaged in the tasks? Is there a way that we can rebuild what we're giving our students so that they are more engaged with what they're doing? Maybe the issue is you're a brand new teacher to this particular content area or a brand new teacher in, in general. So how do you actually take that content and uh, make it accessible for your students, but not oh, get overwhelmed with trying to figure it out yourself? Uh, and finally, timing. How do we fit it all in? So we're going to really try to unpack some of those uh, struggles that we're hearing that the virtual teachers have. And how do we make it fit into uh, your life now as a, as a virtual teacher? So as I started out, I wanted you to really underline this idea that we want to under, uh, find ways that you are never working harder than your student. You've already got degrees. You have already done um, tons of professional development. So you know how to do your job. So now students need to figure out how to do their job as learners. So how do we come up with ways to do that? So all of these um, tips that I'm gonna go through, these seven tips um, are all from this article from Edutopia. And basically what they did is they went through all um, the research of uh, from e-learning and remote instruction, virtual instruction. And they said, these are consistently what data is showing as the most important tools for e-learning. So, um, so this is part of what I've been doing for the last three years is helping teachers um, engage students in an asynchronous, asynchronous model. Um, but the, some of the similar tools can be used in a synchronous model as well, uh, because the issue isn't necessarily um, when the students are doing the work, but that engagement that we're trying to get. So one of the big tools that we know is organization. So how do we rethink um, our workspaces so that they are organized in a way that our students can think about it? So one of the tips that we have is use as few columns as possible. Um, the students only see the columns that are populated. So we know we have four columns in, in, in workspace. So if you know you have students who are going to be overwhelmed, or if you just don't want to overwhelm your students at all, um, only use the evidence column and maybe one other column. That's way that when they log in, they only see that one column. Create short videos. If you know that you have students who are going to constantly ask and re-ask for instructions, create a video just like this one. Post it on your workspace, post it on the activity so that the students will see that. And I'll show you an example of that later. Remove visual clutter. Just because your neighbor has a beautiful workspace with all kinds of headers doesn't mean that you need to it. So we know that visual clutter can also contribute to students' anxiety about what they're working on. So one of the things that you can do is um, not only not put all the bells and whistles on, just use color sparingly. You can also use the ghost group, which is a, I have a, a link here, um, a, a ghost group in order to uh, hide the stuff that you've prepared, but you don't want the students to see yet. So um, as I said, the ghost group. So basically what you do is you associate cards in workspace to a group that has no students in it. So because those cards don't have students, the students can't see them. So it's a way to, to, to prep your ideas. Um, and another way is to chunk the assignment and organize the assignment so everything is all in one place. So I'm gonna open up this, um, this document. This is a great uh, uh, science example and it's all about automating systems. So right here on the single document is explaining what they're gonna do. So this is the curriculum objectives around automating systems, at least in part. So they're going to be able to explain an example. They're going to be able to identify social, economic, environmental impacts. And they're also going to example um, how automation improves or harms society. Well, the way that this is structured is here's the information. So here's the automated system. So at least they're going to be able to talk about driverless cars. 
there's a video here. And of course, in a doc, you can't um, embed a, a video. But what I did do is take a screen cap and I made that a hyperlink. So there's the video, the students can watch it. And if they need the link there, they can also watch it there. And I also have a screen cap of an article that they're gonna read about the racism associated to um, driverless cars. And, um, and then they can go off and read that article. So all of a sudden they can explain an example of an automated system, so a driverless car. All right, so here in this section, um, students can then provide answers. So again, we're in a world where we don't have to photocopy anything. You can make everything in color. So embrace that. How can you use colors to help organize students? Um, so in this case, I have uh, all of the yellow boxes are questions that I am asking the students to do, and they're going to fill in in the question in the sections that are white. So um, so here's what is a uh, system being automated. So obviously I'm gonna put driverless cars, cars, cars going driverless. You know what I'm saying? What social, so make some assumptions. What are the economic implications? So again, that could be from either one of those videos, or you can send them to, here's another option that they can look at. Students who have limited uh, writing skills can maybe uh, also pop in a Screencastify where they're talking about what they're learning. Um, and you can use read and write in this sort of case so that a student who has ESL um, can use the, those uh, cues to be able to have so um, again, then you can also have them do a source and impact. So again, one document and it unpacks every single thing they need to do using color to organize what they're doing. One of the other things that's handy up here is, as I mentioned, here's a screencast of the instruction. So this tells the students, here's the assignment, here's what I want you to do. So if they forget, they can just keep going back and listening to that. Oh, I don't remember, she said something else. I can go back and listen to it. Again, making it as simple as possible not only for your students who really need that um, uh, direction, but your highest achievers who never need support, they're going to see a little bit more and maybe add a little bit more to their work because everything is in one place. They don't have to back and forth. Okay. So again, that's just as easy to pop in a workspace. So just like in the, in the example I showed you, it's really about chunking. Here's the idea. Here's the space to do it. Here's the idea. Here's the space to do it. So, and again, what we want to concentrate on, especially if you are dealing with content that you've never dealt before, is deal with the overalls, the big ideas. What we're trying to do here, friends, is get kids to love learning. Who cares if they can list the components of a cell? What they need to know is cells are the function of all living things. And why does that matter? Well, when we get cancer, it's because cells are going crazy. When we get limp celery, cells are losing water. These are really basic concepts but it's more about understanding the big picture and not those minuscule pieces of information. And one kid might come up with something very different than the other. So again, ride the idea of the big waves and everything else will trickle down. We also know that students have a reduced capacity to work online. So we can't expect them to do the exact same thing that we've done face-to-face. -face. It is impossible for you and it is impossible for them. So just let it go. Have them just enjoy the courses that you're teaching. We know that minimum videos are six minutes. So of course the great irony is this is gonna be a half an hour. Um, but what we know is I can pause this every six minutes, go and do something, come back and listen to it a little bit more. So that's the beauty of recording is that I can chunk it for myself. Um, there are some other tools that you can use to actually force students to chunk, uh, chunk reading and, and writing in this case. And, um, and we also know that we need to balance heavy ideas with brain light activity. So I'm going to show you some of those examples. I also wanted to show you that you can actively use uh, the internet. So Google search. So this is a plain um, Google search where I search for liquids. If you select videos, then tools, you can actually change the duration. So we know that students only handle something less than six minutes. So here's an opportunity to choose a four minute video. Okay. So just a little hack for, um, for those people who want to know that. So as I said, chunking is really important. So part of that is also heavy duty ideas, heavy duty with brain breaks. So there's a few different things here. So for example, here's quick draw. So I'm gonna just pop that open. And basically what quick draw, oh, I've got it in French here. My French is not very good enough for me to, to do this. So here it is in English. So I'm gonna hit let's draw. And again, I got my handy finger and I'm just gonna draw on my screen here. I'm gonna use my mouse. So I'm gonna draw a suitcase. So there I am, I'm gonna draw my suitcase. I see square. And you can hear her, oh she's gonna God. actually it's going to taste. guess. And again, you can think about the power of this in some of those other languages. So now I'm gonna do an oven. I see square. Um, color. That's more of a stove. Maybe. Oh, I know, it's oven. Okay, so now it's a necklace. I see grapes. Oh, I know, 
It's necklace. So again, really, really fast, especially for um, uh, I see square for, for French. Camera. Or mug. You can have them do this or in French, cup. and she guesses she guesses in French, which is really handy. Oh, maybe this cup. I don't know. Um, yeah. I so she's. Coffee. She's running out of time. I don't know. So, so this is the Sorry. idea: is that you could, you yes. get it again. Um, you, you could go in and play with that, and it's again a five-minute break, or you're waiting for students to come. You can have them jumping on and, and playing with that. Google Earth will change your change your world. It has so many cool tools, but again, there's so much heavy things you can do it. But part of that is having them play with it. So I'm just going to jump jump into. So this article here talks about all the things that Google Earth can do, and it's not geography. It's science. It's religion. It's um, storytelling, it's uh, English language, it's literacy, all of those things. And one of the things we really love is this little, uh, on the icon, there's a little uh, dice, which is you're feeling lucky. So you hit that button, it's gonna take you somewhere in the world. And then there's a little side panel that'll actually go through what that looks like. So again, I really, really encourage you to play. And it also has all these tools along the bottom where you can do education, traveling, um, uh, oh back. Um, these are all pre-populated activities that you can do in Google or um, Google Earth. So again, fun things, heavy things, and light things. Um, I'd also encourage you to think about graphic organizers. So we, if we give a kid a blank slate, they're probably going to be less productive than if we chunk out what they need to do. So um, here's alphabet organizers, Google drawings. And again, these are all scaffolding. So some students need scaffolding, some don't. But we know that what can be beneficial uh, is essential for some is beneficial for all. So if we provide some scaffolding, even our highest achievers, they're going to achieve even higher because they're able to scaffold more of their learning. And, and the thing, the other thing to keep in mind is we don't need to ask for products. We can have the students talk us through their process. But if, if um, all of our expectations have ideas around um, finding information, organizing it, looking for it, the inquiry pro process. Well, it's in a process. So instead of looking at, well, how, can you write an essay for me? Maybe the idea is, I want you to show me how you're doing research. I want you to screencastify yourself going through a Google search. And I want you to tell me why you're choosing one Google search over or one Google uh, hit over another one. And then I want you to walk me through how you're actually going out and finding how that's related to the question that you're asking. Ask for feedback. So this might be, hey kids, do you like the products we're doing? Do you like the questions that I'm giving you? Do you like the colors that I'm using? Do, um, are you feeling like I'm hitting, um, doing interesting things? Because the students need to be driving their learning. So listen to them, what do they have to say? And yes, it means that you have to put yourself on and be prepared to maybe hear things that aren't really fun to hear. But if it drives you in forward, and especially if you have this class all year, it's, it's gonna make all the difference in the world to whether you could be successful, okay? So there's lots of different ways to get feedback. So, um, so you can use um, different types of tools. So get students to have a variety. So if you know very clearly what the expectations are, these are the expectations I need to do. These are the success criteria. Then it doesn't matter how the students show you that learning as long as they're showing you the learning. So if the idea is, we'll go back to my automated system. So if the idea is what is an automated system, then the students can show you that they understand that in a variety of different ways. And um, if a student has trouble getting online every day, then maybe they need to be able to do a picture or something on paper and then send it in that way. Um, with, this is why voice and choice becomes that much more important. We know that the students are going to be much more engaged if they have an opportunity to demonstrate in lots of different ways. But this is also not something that you can expect them to do right off the bat. If you put in the work now, you're gonna benefit from that in February, in May, in June, right? But again, like everything else, um, you need to invest in, and promote and have them learn that this is really the best way for them to learn and that they're gonna take that with them. So another way, thing that we need to keep in mind is this idea of annotation and scaffolding. So here I am using really cheesy uh, animation because it works. When students are working through a slide deck and they're having to see the anime, they're much more likely to pay attention to what they're seeing. So use annotations, use Screencastify, have the students draw students' attention. So I can grab the, um, a pen here and write on the screen so that you know um, what I'm drawing your attention to. Um, use Google Forms, Pear Deck, Edpuzzle. I'm going to show you an example in that in a second. Or you can even use something like a Google Custom Google Search. So I'm just going to show you what that looks like. 
So essentially, I have um, a search here where it's Canada on the home front. So when I push that out to the students, it's only going to take those students to the, um, the websites that I've allowed them to, to access. So, um, so if I pull um, this Canada homework, um, so this is, I just grabbed the link here. So now I'm going to, um, I'm going to look up the word king because the king was important. So all of the resources that they're going to get here are only resources that I have said that they can look at. So it's CBC, it's Veterans Affairs, it's um, Canadian Encyclopedia. Um, so all of those, um, those bits and pieces um, scaffolds the internet for them. So they don't get lost all over looking for all kinds of stuff. And this is especially important in something like French language, where you can give them um, French language resources that they are going to be able to comprehend that there's a skill level that they can comprehend so that you they, they aren't going everywhere on the internet trying to find something. They're going to a very specific set of, um, of internet questions. So really, really great way to scaffold kids research. Um, Edpuzzle is another great tool. Um, but essentially what it does is there's all kinds of um, pre-recorded videos, but as the video plays, it stops and then forces a question so that the students have to engage with the question before they can keep watching the video. Um, it also has a dashboard so that when I go back, I can look at the video, I can see who did it, who watched the whole thing, who, um, who got the questions right. So there's all kinds of preloaded stuff. And again, once you have that Edpuzzle link, you pop that in the workspace and the students, again, are doing the work. What does that mean? Well, if they're watching a 20 minute video, well, you are having an opportunity to work with students who might need uh, more direct support, but the rest, the bulk of the class can be doing this video, right? So it's just another way to, uh, because again, that's still synchronous. You are synchronously working with direct students who need the support, but the rest of the class is doing something independently. Think about how often do we do that in our face-to-face -face classrooms where um, they're watching a video, but I'm having little conferences with students um, to talk about work that they're doing or maybe things that they're struggling on. So how do we do that in a, fa in a, in a, in a virtual environment? Because we don't need to be sitting in front of 30 of them every single moment of the day. So again, these are ways to force them to do some activities, but then you get the feedback about their engagement. And again, there's some suggestion here. What we're really trying to do is when we talk about those big ideas, if we do quizzes and, um, well, I'll put it on the next one. So um, want, to, want to create amazing oops. video lessons in minutes? Add puzzle. Okay. So um, so again, you might have a Google quiz. So instead of it being about marks, so that the students have to go in and, and get the marks, make it about mastery. Say to the students, I don't care how many times you take this quiz. I care that you get ninety percent. So either you know the answers to the questions, or you go and find the answers. Because either way, you're learning information. You have either demonstrated that you retained it or you're like, I don't know the answer and I'm going out to find the answer. So again, in a Google slide, uh, sorry, in a Google form, I'm gonna know how many times those kids have attempted those questions. And I would be able to use that to inform my observations of conversation. And so that comes along to um, this idea of frequent low stakes quizzes. So it's not about giving kids um, big tests, it's about saying to them, um, I just want to know where you are. This isn't about marks. It's it's I want to know where you're at. And I want you to know where you're at. So um, again, uh, using things like Flippity or Quizlet and uh, even Kahoot, um, those are ways the students can gauge their own understanding in order to um, better improve their learning. Okay. So here's another few examples. So uh, Tracy Nezrella has this amazing idea where you use formatting. So um, as you, as you, the students click on the various boxes in here, the um, the rest of the the information changes color. So it's only good when it turns green. So again, as she goes down the line, um, the answer, students answer the question and then um, it gives them a direct feedback. Because we know if a student is doing the, the same type of question wrong every single time, they're not gonna learn anything. So here's a, a video here about um, Google Forms. Here's Flippity where you can make one spreadsheet with all your key terms and key ideas on it, and then it can be put in a bunch of different types of questions. And maybe part of your activity is have the students just ask questions, that they need to ask questions about the topics that you are going to engage in. 
we really need to connect with our students. The more we can engage on a personal level with our students, the more they're going to trust us, they're going to trust the system. So um, something like this can be as simple as adding an image of yourself to your Google profile, encouraging your students to do that. Use screencast. So here I am in my, uh, you know, five o'clock on a, on a Tuesday night. I'm here, my face is here, because what it's saying is there is a real person talking to you about this. There is a real person who wants to connect with you. So communicate as often as you can individually with your students. Not just the same email that might be jumping on their docs, and giving them comments, that might be doing screencasts just like this in which you are saying their names. Because we know that the more you can engage with them as an actual human person, the more they're going to engage back with you in the learning. Um, so again, a couple different ideas. Here's how you can uh, provide feedback in a Google Doc. So there's a bunch of different ways to do that. Um, Mike Bernards, who teaches over at LBP, he basically has a challenge with his students where he has them all. So he has the same group of students every day, all day. Um, so he has his students upload a new picture um, on and different themes. So who's your favorite 80s character? What's your favorite insect? What's your favorite dish? So, um, and he's found that that really engages and also helps him learn a little bit more about a student in a way he wouldn't if they just had those initial staring back. Okay, and there's a video there about how to actually go about doing that. You can give to your students or use for yourself. Oh, they're both gonna click that. That's not okay. Um, it is really important that we think about why we need our cameras on. And there is um, students aren't going to sh to be on camera if they don't feel like the community is 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 ready for them. So this article basically just talks about how how can we go about creating a community so that students feel uh, interested in in turning on their camera, and what can we do if that's not possible for them? So um, to really think about why it is that we want them to turn our camera on and maybe instead of fighting that fight it's about how can we change so that's a really good learning from therapy is the only person you can change is yourself so if you are struggling with your students how can you reframe what your your expectations are for yourself so that you your students are in a much better um much better place and then so flipgrid is a really really amazing tool again to engage students in all kinds of different ways um, but again, to allow them to see faces, give feedback to each other, it's asynchronous, but you can also use it in a synchronous environment. And there's a whiteboard and there's tons of cool products in there. And students really, really love it. We have a lot of French teachers who are using this with quite a lot of success. So um, just a gather way to engage in a community. And then finally, as the last part is looking after yourself. This stuff is hard. Learning a whole new strategy for teaching is hard. So what I really want you to think about is how can you minimize your stress by really leveraging some of these tools and so reaching out to us and LT to your the different consultants in your departments how how can you reframe the work that you are providing your students so that they are doing the hard work and not you and so that you can get to a place where you feel really happy about unplugging over the weekend and so with that, I really hope that um, there are some really good things. I'm going to put this in the doobly-doo of this video. Um, and, I, and I really hope that you can have um, some, some really great success in, in years, years to come.